Major General Marion E. Carl. The sky was full of them. Major General Marion E. Carl was one of the Marine Corps' foremost aviators. In World War II, he was a leading ace with 18 kills of Japanese aircraft. He later was a test pilot and rose to command a Marine aircraft wing. In this segment of an oral history interview conducted in 1973, Carl, who was a first lieutenant at the beginning of World War II, describes his actions as a fighter pilot in VMF-221 in the opening action of the pivotal Battle of Midway. The first priority of the Japanese was to neutralize the Marine base on Midway. A very small force of Marine fighter pilots sorted out to confront the 108-plane Air Armada headed toward Midway to overwhelm the Marine defenders. For Carl and the other fighter pilots, in VMF-221, this was their first combat. For most of them, it was also their last. Although the Marines had prepared for the attack, as in all combat situations, whether in the air, on the ground, or at sea, things do not go according to plan, as we learn from the following account. Battle of Midway itself, about two weeks before the battle, we got some F-4Fs. I don't remember just how many, but there was some place in the neighborhood of eight. And one division, all the divisions were six airplanes and two airplane elements. And one division got F-4Fs, and I was in that division. So I was flying F-4Fs in the Battle of Midway. John Carey had the division. He was the division leader. And on the scramble that morning, um, we were one of the first ones to get off. But unfortunately, McCarthy and his, one of the element leaders, McCarthy and his, uh, was mad, was up on patrol in F 4S. We never saw him again. So that left just four in that division. Schwanzberger was one of the others. So that left Kerry, Canfield, Carl, and Schwanzberger left. Canfield was my wingman, and Schwanzberger was Kerry's wingman. Well, on the scramble, Schwanzberger got screwed up somehow or other and joined up on the wrong division. Well, it was too late to hot scramble it, so uh, that's just the way it was. And as far as the group was concerned, as it turned out, they'd forgotten, uh, apparently, the two airplanes had been up on, on, uh, on uh, patrol, and they didn't know that Schwarzberger hadn't joined up, so they assumed that the F-4S, which was, was, they felt was the better airplanes, I suppose, was the uh, six-plane division, and they vectored us out, and we went out by ourselves. Now, I don't know if the rest of them went out by themselves or not with this division, but they didn't put the whole squad in together and send it out as one flight. So they sent us out, and we're going out, and as I remember, somewhere around 12, 14,000 feet is what the altitude they told us to take. I gave us the vector, and I put Canfield up on Carrie's wing, and now I'm tailing Charlie all by myself. Well, we run into the, we run into the chaps out, say, 30 miles or so. I've forgotten exactly how far. It wasn't too far, 30, 30 miles. And we're both the bombers, so we like to make a, what's called a overhead. So just roll over our back and come right straight down from the club. And just about the time when we're ready to roll over, I catch sight of all these damn zeros up above, which I've not seen. There were some clouds. Christ, the air was full of them. So, I complete my pass, but instead of pulling out, just normally, and going on up ahead, like Terry and Canfield apparently had done, I'd already lost track of them. I just did this and went the opposite direction, see. It took me about five seconds to figure out that if I pulled out and for the island, I was going to have zeros all over me. If I pulled out and went away from the island, since they were to be covering the bombers, they probably wouldn't follow me, and they didn't. Well, Canfield and Terry both got shot up pretty badly, but both got back. I lost, just as soon as they rolled over, I'd lost track of them, so I wasn't, I've never seen them again anyway, so I said, okay, go away on So now I hit for the, I climb up to 20,000 feet and head back to Midway. I can't find a friendly airplane in any place. There's not a phone in the whole sky as far as I can. I can't seem to contact anybody on the radio in there. Of course, in those days, we didn't use the radio very much. 
So, uh, Jesus Christ. That's fiddling around up there. Next thing I know, I've got a damn shoe on my tail. Well, he's shooting away and trying to figure out how to get rid of him, and I come up on a cloud. So I fly through the cloud. It's just one of those big puffy clouds like they have out there. And just as I hit the cloud, I chop the gun and threw the damn thing into a skin, see? Well, I come out the other side, the zero's overrun me, see? He's, he's come up on me so fast that he can't do anything to pull up his own and so on. So he goes, he ducks down. I wish he'd pulled up. I would have made a mistake I did. But anyway, he ducks down and goes under me. And now he's out ahead of me. I shove over and pull the trigger on my guns and get nothing. Because the same time I shove over and pull the trigger, all the damn ammunition at the top of the, of the, and every all four guns just plugged up right there, see. If I just waited a second, pulled over, and then pulled it, pushed over, and let that thing stabilize for a second, for a moment, and then pulled the trigger, everything had been all right. But I, I was pretty green, I didn't know it better. Well, nevertheless, that scared him so bad that he took off. Now I'm looking at it, I'm trying to get things, get some, get the guns unplugged. I think I've got three out of the four of them unplugged by hand charging. And I'm looking around, and pretty soon all the airplanes are left midway, except I see three zeros still filling around down there. So I pick one that looks good and dive on him and get him. The rest of them have all gone off. I guess I probably got the last airplane that was hanging around the island. And I go in on that. And that, of course, there was 25 of us took off. Of the 25, 10 returned, as I remember. As General Carl's description of the battle indicates, Marines responded bravely and determinedly in the face of overwhelming odds. Carl's account reveals how, despite the best preparations, plans went awry once the enemy was engaged. Instead of going into battle with a six-plane division, there were only three aircraft that plunged into the Japanese attack force. Then he discovered that the Japanese fighters were at a higher than expected altitude. Carl became detached from the other two members of his flight. The one thing to be expected, an attack by an enemy aircraft, unfortunately did occur. The unexpected again occurred when the guns on his Wildcat aircraft jammed. So, this first combat outing was a real trial by fire. Carl's training, the understanding of his aircraft, his weapon systems, tactical astuteness, and clear-minded aggressive action allowed him to shoot down an enemy aircraft, and most importantly to survive when most of his squadron mates did not. The question then is, how realistic is our training today? Are Marines being trained to fully know their weapon or weapon systems, to take the initiative and to be flexible in combat, to expect the unexpected, and to remain clear-minded and purposeful when confronting an enemy that has all the advantages in a seemingly hopeless situation. For additional information on Marines at the Battle of Midway, read Marines at Midway by Lt. Col. Robert D. Heinel, Jr., World War II, the Battle of Midway, from the Leatherneck, June 1992, by R.R. R. Keene, and Miracle at Midway, by Gordon Prange.